Hello, everyone. So glad you can join me, as well as my husband, Ricky, and More Grace Ministries for the second day of presentations in the Changing Our Lens workshop. This is actually day two in your uh, schedule, and I am actually going over the racial past of the American church today. Our journey in this moment is going to be a little bit challenging for some of you and deeply challenging for others. It is important that as Christians, we engage the presence of the Lord Jesus as we move through this history and the story. For those of us who are deeply tied to the church and especially the Presbyterian church, this history is not easy to hear. In fact, there may be moments of great pain. We might have a tendency to fall into areas of deep shame as well. So in order to mitigate that as much as we can, we are going to have moments where we invite the presence of the Lord to process with us, to stand with us in the painful moments of these stories and to teach us how to find ways to work against uh, systemic racism inside and outside of the church. And for some of you, that might be a really uncomfortable concept to even put together systemic racism and the church, but we cannot ignore the past of America. We certainly can't ignore the past of the American church I need to define for you before we jump into this what I understand is the American church. It is the evangelical Protestant uh, side of American Christianity, as well as the Catholic or Catholicism side of American Christianity. Those two strands and all the various uh, denominations and degrees of worship and expression are part of what I am defining as the American church. Throughout the presentation, I will be referring to the American church, but it is also important that you know that I'm gonna zero down on the Presbyterian church as well. I will give you a heads up that there will be some disturbing information um, as we move toward the middle of the presentation. So, I attempted to minimize the pictures as much as I can in terms of lynching, but we will discuss lynching in this uh, presentation. I invite you to prayerfully consider what and how you would like to uh, engage the Lord. I have a uh, directive that has worked for many that uh, we've been ministering to. It is called the Emmanuel Approach Prayer. And so that's the prayer directive that we're going to actually operate in. It is one of many tools that are out there to help people deal with not only uh, the history of racism, but also the questions that have arisen because of America's racial past. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to presenting this uh, material with you, but I also wanna start with prayer as we move forward. So Holy Spirit, we just invite your presence here in the name of Jesus. We ask for your capacity to be downloaded to everyone that is listening, no matter what where they are, no matter what time of day or moment they may be listening in. We invite your presence and your direction, your processing power, and above all, your healing power. If there be any racial triggers or memories of trauma that are evoked during this presentation. We thank you that angels of Jesus are already appointed to those that are experiencing these things or may be experiencing these moments. And we invite your presence and your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. As many of you know, my name is uh, Dr. Julia Robinson Moore. I am a teaching elder in the Presbytery of Charlotte, and I have been ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA since 2004. I'm a native Detroiter, and so I moved to Charlotte in 2005. I have had the privilege of ministering in many Presbyterian churches in Mecklenburg County, 
and throughout the Presbytery of Charlotte. So it is my privilege to partner with the Faith and Justice Group at Providence Presbyterian Church to uh, present this information to you. I'm going to share my screen now and we will get started. I want to remind everyone that the Emmanuel approach journaling that we will be doing throughout this presentation is by Dr. E. James Wilder and also Dr. Carl Lehman. So you may look them up at your leisure to find more information about this approach. So hopefully all of you are able to see me now. And I've titled, after much thought, I've titled this Confronting Complicity because that's what this presentation is about. And through my conversations with members of Providence Presbyterian Church here in Charlotte, the uh, idea and the definition of complicity has come up in, in our conversations. And so I wanted to really bring that in. My husband, Ricky Moore, has talked to you about the word conciliation, which is not reconciliation. Conciliation is a mediating between two opposing forces or two uh, groups that are in tension. And I would venture to say that black and white Christians in America are still in a very tenuous relationship. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said way back in the 1960s that Sunday mornings are still the most segregated hour in America. Certainly we could look across the American church universally and see that uh, there are moments or pockets where you have multicultural churches that are uh, lively and thriving. But for the most part, your mainline denominations still are predominantly segregated by race. Given the gains of the modern civil rights movement, given all of the uh, steps that uh, Americans and people of color have made in this country, why is it that Sunday mornings are still segregated by race? Hopefully this presentation will answer some of those questions. So I stand not only as a Presbyterian minister, but also for some of you who know my other job as a UNC Charlotte professor, I want you to know that the claims and beliefs and the statements from this PowerPoint have nothing to do with UNC Charlotte. And so therefore I need you to sort of divorce me from UNC Charlotte in this moment and just look at me as a Presbyterian minister that stands in the faith of Jesus Christ and in uh, the role of teaching elder in the Presbytery of Charlotte. So, one of the things that we're going to do as we begin this journey, and hopefully all of you now have your uh, journal and you have something to write with, and you're at a place where you are peaceful and free of distractions, I'm going to invite all of you to start this journey with me, this very hard journey of hearing the stories of racism and racial violence with the Emmanuel approach journaling. So I invite you to start with a positive memory. It should be splinter free of any negativity. So a completely positive memory. If you've been following along with the videos, you know that uh, you can even think of your best slice of chocolate cake and think about that and invite the Lord Jesus into that memory. And then write down everything that comes to mind. It could be the way the chocolate felt, tasted, smelled. And as you invite the Lord Jesus into that memory, ask him to help you perceive his presence. He might show up in the warmth of the moment or the hour. He might show up in the smile of a loved one you might be with. And as you feel his presence, write down what you sense, feel, or hear. And then as you move into this moment and you sense the Lord's presence, ask him to help you feel his presence in this moment right here. So you should have a sense of remembering him in that beautiful memory, but you should also have a sense 
of hearing him and seeing him and feeling his presence in this moment. And then as you are writing this down, whatever you're sensing, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're he hearing, I want you to ask him in the, his name, in the name of Jesus, to give you his capacity as you listen to this history and to be aware of people and institutions you need to forgive. Remembering that just like Father Uba, you are a Christian and even if you aren't a Christian, you might consider becoming one. When you are a Christian, you have the capacity of Christ in you. You have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And it is his capacity that allows you to listen, hear, and even endure places and memories of pain. I encourage you if you're able to and you have you find that you have many things that you are hearing the Lord say to you, you can always pause this video, finish writing your thoughts down, and then come back and move forward. And I certainly encourage you to do that in every Emmanuel moment that we have built into this presentation. So, one of the ways that we continue to build capacity is through the manual prayer, which you've just uh, experienced and the manual journaling. If you remember, for those of you who are able to hear the first part, manual prayer is not just about writing and, and uh, hearing. It, it can also be done with loved ones or friends that you feel safe with. So sometimes the manual prayer is done in groups of two or three. Again, I point you to Carl Lehman's book uh, and Dr. Uh, Jim Wilder's books on the Emmanuel approach that can lay out steps for that. There's also a group called Face to Face Ministries uh, that offers a podcast that also has steps and also does workshops. The last thing I want to remember, want you to remember as we move through this is the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness, according to Father Ubal, makes you free. And we know we have a voice greater than Father Ubal's, and that's Jesus Christ, who tells us to love our enemies, to bless those that curse us and persecute us, to do good to those who hurt us. So I invite you to remember that, relying not on your own capacity, but on the Lord's capacity as we move through this moment and through this history and through this story. We're gonna start with the Jamestown and Christianity. Many people, when they hear the story of Jamestown and a lot of the tragedies that happened and the first settlement ever founded really on the shores of America, sometimes that story is told outside the bounds of uh, Christian history. But on April 26, 1607, Reverend Robert Hunt went ashore to dedicate the continent to the glory of God. History tells us that besides an incredibly grueling and long journey, he made the members of the White Lion uh, privateer ship stay on board for an extra three days, fasting and praying to hear the voice of God and to hear his direction as they set foot on the shores of what we now know as America. One of the members of the boat wrote of the native populations, the indigenous Native Americans that we also sadly remember how horribly they were treated. But in the beginning, it appears that the Christians that landed on Jamestown had the best intentions per se. One of the settlers wrote, we are taught to acknowledge every man that beareth the impression of God's stamp to be not only our neighbor, but to be our brother. So we see here that in the first early beginnings of Jamestown that Christians had the best intentions of treating all that they met as neighbors and as brothers and sisters. When the members finally debarked off of that ship and they came 
to the shores of what we now know as Jamestown. They offered prayers at what we understand as Cape Henry. And for those of you who've been to Virginia Beach, you've probably seen uh, this area. If you pay attention to the declaration of Reverend Robert Hunt, who says, we dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to raise up godly generations after us. And with these generations, take the kingdom of God to all the earth. I'll let you continue to read the rest of this quote, but we see here that not only did they have the best intentions, but they wanted to live a life dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the spreading of it, and to creating an equitable society where all are one in Christ Jesus. They even erected this cross that you see uh, that they took back uh, with, with them, took from England, in order to establish as a symbolic representation of their goal of establishing Christianity on the shores of America and being kind to those that they met. What many people don't know about many of the settlers of Jamestown is that they were Presbyterians. Typically Presbyterians like to start their history with uh, Francis making me. Uh, but we're gonna start actually with Jonestown. So Reverend Robert Hunt was actually a Presbyterian and he was a very noted Presbyterian. In fact, many of the financial backers of settlement trips to America that brought some of the first colonists here were Presbyterians, they were chaplains. So, the history of the Presbyterian Church in particular is very salient to the founding of America. And it's also salient to the prayers, those initial prayers that were prayed for this country and the vision of America uh, that Presbyterians really brought to the fore. So let's look at what happened how did the sentiments of brotherly love and of treating everyone kind become what I call compromised by the culture that was also surrounding elements of Christianity? And let's remember that when the first settlers came to the shores of North America, they were looking for freedom. They were looking for freedom from religious tyranny, from economic oppression, and they processed their journey, they processed the goals with the presence of God. And prayer was very much a part of their process. However, all of that prayer did not keep them from falling prey to other cultural pressure, pressures. We're specifically gonna look at slavery and race in American Presbyterianism. And there, unfortunately, is a long-standing tie between the history of American Presbyterianism and the institution of slavery. The first slave is reported to hit the shores of North America, specifically in Virginia in 1619. And we remember that those settlers who came off the ship named White Lion had the best intentions in 1607. But almost 12 years later, they are importing slaves into their community. And some of you may have been to uh, areas near Virginia or Virginia Beach and seen this historical marker of where the first slave landed. It is important to know that not only was the American church at the heart of American slavery in this respect, but that Presbyterians were, because Presbyterians made up most of the settlement of Jamestown. Presbyterians, if you study Presbyterian history in the colonies, know that many uh, denominations were uh, starting their roots here, but American Presbyterianism had situated itself in the upper echelon of America's power structures 
in the colonial period, and that continued to increase. Some of our governors, even the writers of many of uh, the state constitutions that we know in the middle colonies are, uh, can be linked back to Presbyterian affiliations. When the church at large, and this is all denominations, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Episcopalian, Congregationalists, uh, most of these mainline denominations and even those that I have not named, begin to massively import many, many slaves from the west coast of Africa in what is known as the Atlantic slave trade. This presentation doesn't have enough time to go into uh, how vital Presbyterian uh, trade was, Presbyterian affiliated trade was in the Atlantic slave trade, especially in places like uh, Barbados and Bermuda. What we do know is that not only did all churches that claimed an affiliation or a connection to Christianity engage in some form of the institution of slavery, we do know that Presbyterians were very much a part of that. And in the 1600s, they worked together with other uh, Christians and various denominations to deal with the issue of baptism and ideas of freedom. Usually if a slave was brought in the 1600s, that slave, that African slave, or even the Native American that may have been enslaved was assumed to be heathen and heathens could thereby justifiably in the Christian minds at the time be enslaved. There was an understanding that if a person became a Christian, that Christians could not enslave other Christians. So in the beginning, up until almost the 1740s, <clears throat> excuse me, Christianity was used uh, to claim racial distinctions. You say, what do I mean by that? Well, usually if you were a Christian, you were automatically assumed white. If you were non-Christian, you were automatically assumed to be a person of either African or Native American descent. Early on, you had ideas of Europeanness or even specifically Europeans from England being classified as the only true definition of Christians and the only symbolic uh, representation of Christianity, whereas any other groups were not. This also included Europeans. By the 1700s, however, this began to change and many, many other uh, European ethnicities were sort of put in the box of being Christian, while racial uh, colors and ethnicities of skin tone began to be identified as non-Christian. Well, you had many missionaries who had the call to want to evangelize uh, slaves, African slaves, Native American slaves, and even poor whites. And as missionaries attempted to evangelize these groups and these groups converted to Christianity, then they wanted to be baptized, which is an outward expression of an inward reality, right? That you have become a Christian. Well, that created a dilemma. Many slaveholders now realize that according to the dictates of their own faith, they could not in all good conscience enslave Christians. And so they began to figure out ways by which they could make a racial distinction between themselves and those that they were enslaved that would transcend uh, Christian uh, identity, that would transcend the vows that uh, Christians had made in baptism that would basically transcend who they were in Christ. My argument here is that these begin a place where Christianity began to be corrupted. And it was corrupted not by the Christian doctrines itself, but by the appropriation and the manipulation of Christian doctrine by uh, slaveholders and those that wanted to maintain power and subjugation over non-white peoples. While all denominations that we can classify under Protestantism, as well as the Catholic Church, participated in this, the Presbyterian churches were also very much a vital part of this. 
We see this in the creation of slave codes. Sometimes they're referred to as black codes. This is one out of many in Virginia. This is in 1667. And you can read uh, the whole text for you. I'll just lift up a couple of highlights here. It says that slaves by birth and by the charity and piety of their owners made partakers of the blessed sacrament of baptism should by virtue of their baptism be made free. It is enacted and declared by this grand assembly and the authority thereof that the conferring of baptism, however, does not alter the condition of the person as to his bondage or freedom. So isn't this a fascinating text, right? It's almost like it's contradicting itself. Should by virtue of their baptism be free. However, they've created a caveat. If you were enslaved, your baptism still doesn't alter your bondage or freedom. And as you continue to read, it also added an addendum. It say, well, if you become a Christian, that's great, but you're not free here in this world. But you, we are allowed to teach your children the dictates of Christianity, but even then, they are not free if they convert to Christianity. This law was a reflection of all of the religious sentiment across the board of Christianity, you know, regardless of denomination or form of Christianity, whether Protestant or Catholicism, uh, that uh, really shaped the ways in which Christianity began to be manipulated and molded to fit uh, the, and accommodate the institution of slavery and all of the evils that went with it. And here are some of the other kinds of corruptions that I would make an argument. From the 1667 and there are other laws that you can look up, they begin to emerge theological contradictions and the understanding of what the body of Christ is. So if you think about Jamestown and those Presbyterians that first hit the shores and how they wanted to uh, treat everyone as brothers and sisters, treat everyone with equality in the faith, those who were Christians, they would probably totally have upheld Galatians uh, chapter three, verses 26 through 28, where there's neither Jew nor free, slave, uh, Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor they are male or female, for you are all in one in Christ Jesus. However, in order to uh, stay true to their economic gains, which became more important to them than their Christian identity, many Christians on both sides of the Christian tree began to lift up other scriptures that uh, took precedent over scriptures like Galatians. And so these scriptures that you have here on the right side of your screen are all scriptures used in the justification of slavery. For many New Testament scholars, these scriptures are taken out of context and appropriated in various ways by both Northern and Southern Christians. We see the most prolific uh, explanation and theological arguments by Southern uh, Christians, especially Southern Presbyterians who really led the the uh, forefront in, in these kinds of theological assertions. We see part of this hit some, what I call backlash, some conscious uh, realities that are now beginning to prick the consciousness of many uh, Presbyterians in the United States, uh, or what we know as the colonies back then was in the United States. And you have your General Assembly in 1818 began to recognize that slavery was just a really harsh and cruel institution and that the church shouldn't have anything to do with it. It boldly claimed at the General Assembly level that slavery was a gross violation of the most precious and sacred rights of human nature. And yet, it persisted. Sale notices like these continued way past 1818 and many churches across the land had members, good upstanding members who went to church every Sunday that would still engage in the buying and selling of slaves, of giving away their children 
slave children or breaking up marriages or unions between slave families. And all of this was done under the justification of slavery by what scholars now today recognize as a misappropriation and a corruption of the true intentions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most noted uh, Presbyterian that really was the voice of the justification of slavery within the church that many Christians who believed in the institution of slavery as an ordained institution by God was Robert L. Dabney. There's lots of information on him. One of his most stark statements was presented in his defense of Virginia and through her of the South in pending context against the sectional party. And if you look at 1867, you see that this is all around the, the Civil War era. He says here, it may be that we should find little difficulty in tracing the lineage of the present Africans to Ham. God has authorized domestic slavery. The principle is settled that it cannot necessarily be sin in itself. This authorization that is tied to his understanding of how Africans are related to Ham, and this is the Ham out of Genesis 9, that refers to the curse of Ham that you will hear and see in, in a lot of scholarship. Genesis chapter nine was used by ministers like Dabney to justify the enslavement of Africans. And African peoples as well as other non-white people were read into the story about Noah uh, being exposed and seen by his son, Ham. That text actually goes in and says that curse shall be Ham and he shall be the slave of his brothers. Again, another misappropriation of the text in order to justify the institution of slavery. That text began to be the main foreground by which Christians who were engaged in the institution of slavery, no matter what denomination or uh, aspect of Christianity, they could use that text to say that God must have ordained Africans and non-white peoples to be enslaved because their skin color was different. In fact, black skin and brown skin was read in that Genesis text. This also allowed them, Christians, who were slaveholders, to feel good about still evangelizing slaves and yet to keeping them in a, an oppressed status. And so the Presbyterian Church in particular was very instrumental in seeing uh, the evangelism of slaves. The Presbyterian churches did not have the numbers that the Baptists and the Methodists did. In fact, the Baptist missionaries totally outnumbered uh, in, in terms of uh, congregants that converted to Christianity uh, among the slaves and native peoples. Uh, they totally outnumbered uh, Presbyterians in, in their efforts, as well as the Methodists. The Methodists also outnumbered the Presbyterians. However, Presbyterians uh, still made an inroad and they created Sabbath schools, which were very uh, attractive to slaves who were trying to find some kind of level of equality for their children and including themselves. And so Presbyterians began to open up Sabbath schools that were held in either the balcony or the basements. Slaves usually had to enter from the back door. They were never allowed to worship and be taught at the same time as uh, white Christians in the church. And catechisms and the lessons that were taught included learning about the alphabet. So we do have a, a weird kind of uh, space where the Presbyterian church especially begins to educate its slave population but under a very controlled space and never ever allowing them full equality in the church and certainly not outside the church and never of course giving them their freedom. For me as a scholar who studies this, this is another corruption of 
Christianity and certainly a tremendous compromise of the first uh, initiatives of the Christians, especially the Presbyterian Christians at Jamestown. So as we move further, let's look at the slave owning groups within the Presbyterian church and in particular, and we can make this large, uh, uh, sort of uh, generalization based on this. We can use the sort of micro story of the Presbyterian Church to give us a window into looking at how Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, and even, and even uh, Congregationalists might have also uh, had members that were slave owners. It was not unusual in the South specifically for ministers to own slaves, for elders, and deacons. In the Presbyterian Church, all of these groups owned slaves and they owned mass plantations. And uh, many of these owners also brought and sold slaves, as well as uh, made sure that they uh, passed their slaves on to their children as property in estate wills. This is certainly the case here in uh, North Carolina. I've given you a lot to think about in a short amount of time, and I've just touched the surface on the slave owning history of the church and just a few moments in the timeline of uh, American Christianity where slavery was allowed to flourish and prosper in the middle of the church by Christians. So I'm hoping I've gotten rid of the idea that only white supremacist slave owners who were incredibly uh, isolated and few and far between uh, and not really a part of the main churches and were across the nation. I hope I've sort of gotten rid of that and presented to you the fact that many churches among a variety of denominations owned slaves and engaged in all the horrors of the slave system. My presentation doesn't have time to go into all of the money made off of the backs of slaves and how that wealth was passed down in church families generation after generation. But we want to take a pause as we deal with these stories. And for those of you who have done a little bit of history in your own genealogy, and you realize that you may be one of those slave owning families, you may be a descendant of a slave owning family, or you may have been a slave, you may have had ancestors who were slaves, excuse me, you may have had ancestors who were slaves connected to churches that broke away from their churches that evangelized them. Let's take a moment and look at the Emmanuel approach and engage in this moment. We wanna ask, invite Jesus into that positive memory. Give us a break, but also to reset our brains and to bring peace as we've heard this. And so I invite you as you begin this Emmanuel journaling moment to write down what comes to mind, to follow these steps all the way to step eight and write down what thoughts what feelings, what memories came to mind, but start with a positive memory and invite the Lord into that. Take time to feel his presence in that memory and write that down. Ask him to help you feel his presence in the very moment that you're experiencing now by hearing this history. And then most importantly, ask him who or what you need to forgive. Some of you may need to forgive your church. 
Some of you may need to forgive your ancestors, your family members who owned slaves. Some of you who had ancestors that were enslaved, you may need to stop and ask the Lord to help you forgive those who enslaved your family members. There may be some of you who are remembering other moments of racial trauma, or maybe you're remembering stories passed down. I invite you to work through this process with the Emmanuel approach and process with the Lord, hear his voice, feel his presence, and rely on his capacity to lead you through this moment here. Take your time in writing and working through these eight steps. Please pause the video at this point so that you may work all the way through step eight. And then let's start again. So hopefully some of you were able to stop the video and work through uh, steps one through eight in the manual, manual journaling process. I'm hoping you were able to speak some of those questions out loud and hear them around you and tune to the spontaneous thoughts or images or presence that uh, you felt. I encourage you to not rush through the Emmanuel process in this respect, but really, really dig down deep and take a moment to work through those stages. And I'm hoping all of you prayed again that you ask the Lord for his capacity to hear the next stage of this story. We're going to begin with looking at the American church and complicities in racial and religious discrimination after the Civil War. And the first picture that you have here is a church here in, in, uh, in the South. And uh, you can see that many members are in the middle of a worship service and they are part of the Ku Klux Klan. You will see a couple of Grand Dragons sitting up on the pulpit and you see, of course, the minister shaking hands with uh, one of the leaders of the Klan here. This picture is so powerful because it, it says two things. Number one, that Christianity has, uh, has deep roots in uh, American forms of racism. And it also speaks of the complicity of the larger culture, especially in the South, that links anti-Black violence and terrorism with Christianity. How else would a church like this worship and sing hymns to the Lord and pray, and at the same time invite the Ku Klux Klan, who has a uh, substantiated record with the United States FBI on the Federal Bureau, right, of, of investigations of numerous lynchings and attacks against non-white peoples, especially African Americans. This picture speaks volumes about the complicity as well as the silence. And some of you might be thinking, well, if uh, I, my church didn't have anything to do with the Klan, there's a forms of racism. There are forms of racism that can be active and passive. There are churches like this that were very active in racism. There are other churches that were very passive, meaning that they knew that the lynchings were happening. They knew that Jim Crow segregation and uh, violence was happening but they never raised their voice. They never protested. They never confronted their brothers and sisters in the same faith and race about the ways in which they were not living up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The only way a picture like this can truly exist is if the gospel of Jesus Christ has been corrupted in some way. And we can certainly see that racism was allowed to flourish even after the Civil War with such a great loss of life. And it was allowed to flourish in the church. There are churches across America that uh, had a unspoken reality of empathizers and sympathizers as well as members of uh, white supremacist groups. Certainly here in Mecklenburg County, we have histories of churches that are all, were also part of that thinking. And we certainly have it in the Presbyterian Church. Here is a story of a lynching that happened in 1903. It was uh, attended by hundreds and hundreds of people, almost as a form of entertainment. Ironically, this lynching of George White was started by a Presbyterian minister named Reverend R. A. Elwood at Olivet Presbyterian Church. It was known that uh, Reverend Elwood was a Ku Klux Klan sympathizer. Many of his members, though, some of them may have been part of the Klan, but many of them were just everyday, hardworking church people going to church, singing hymns, following the Presbyterian polity. And yet, on June 20th, he does a sermon based on an alleged accusation of George White for having murdered uh, a young girl. He does a sermon that draws all of the Wilmington community to his church. And he actually has supposed or alleged uh, rags from the crime scene with the blood of the young girl on it. And he waves it above the pulpit and saying, should the murderer of Miss Bishop be lynched? The crowd from the church left after the benediction and ran out into the streets of Wilmington and to the jailhouse and looked for George White, forcibly took him, took him out of his jail cell and brutalized him in all sorts of ways. He was punctured with holes. His fingers were cut off. Other limbs were cut off. He was drugged through the streets and many people were called from other counties in North Carolina to come and witness this. So much so that people say there might have been thousands of people there to watch this lynching. George White was eventually dismembered and burned. And after he was burned, children were brought to this lynching. And after he was burned, newspapers said that children were actually picking uh, bones and uh, burnt fingers out of what was left of George White. The question is, how could a church engage in such brutality, in such murderous fits and actions. Here is another moment where the American church compromised its truths to the gospel. It compromised its call to love their neighbor as itself. It allowed avarice, fear, even money and what theologians would call mammonism to cloud the truths of the gospel. And it opened the door for all sorts of heinous crimes. If you travel to areas in Wilmington in Delaware uh, today, um, I think I said Wilmington, this is supposed to be Delaware, excuse me. Um, I think it's Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, you'll see that um, a memorial for George White where he was lynched. And the family members, the descendants of George White, 
were also recognized. And so you can Google uh, this and, and read for yourself. The question still remains though, what do we do with this history? So for so long, many churches have ignored uh, the complicity of other parts of the body of Christ and some of the heinous things they've done to people of color. We see the racial unrest happening in America today and we wonder, the church wonders what it can do. The first thing it could do is begin to engage this history, to talk about it and to process it with the person of Jesus Christ and the presence of God. Let's look a little deeper uh, at the American church and its complicities with racial segregation. During the modern civil rights movement, we have many, many churches begin to deny uh, people of color a seat in their congregations. In fact, many of the churches that we see today in the South uh, made it a point to help newly freed African Americans establish their own churches, some by force and some as a sort of afterthought when African Americans by their own agency decided to leave the oppression of the church and the duplicity of Christian brotherhood that was spouted by churches and create their own churches, create their own congregations. So this sign that you see here is in an Assembly of God church, and I want to make sure that I'm just not picking on the Presbyterians. Um, all churches had some level of segregation, and these segregation policies were uh, unspoken. By the time you get to the modern civil rights movement, however, uh, many, many churches become very uh, outspoken uh, about the ways in which they do not want to integrate their churches. Many of these uh, groups believe that it was a sin to even sit next to a person of color. And many had fears that that person of color would uh, in intermarry into their families. This, remember, is happening at the same time that we have, uh, uh, what is it, just maybe six or seven years before uh, the 1960s, we have the Brown versus Board of Education that tries and attempts to desegregate schools at that time. And I say tries and attempts because while Brown versus Board of Education happened in 1954, places throughout the South uh, fought against that des desegregation. And so some, uh, regions in the South did not desegregate until 15 to 20 years later. Uh, North Carolina is one of those places where uh, we don't have the beginnings of desegregation until uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s. So again, we see that the church is complicit in not only um, segregation, but also lynching culture. And I, I say that is because when the modern civil rights movement happens, you have a number, a number of violence going, uh, violent actions going on. If you remember Kelly Ingram Park with Dr. Martin Luther King, if you remember Emmett Till and Medgar Evers um, and numerous other unfortunate deaths by civil rights workers, these uh, killings are not happening in a vacuum. They're happening in Southern towns and communities where there are churches, where people are going to church every Sunday. And yet there's a culture that is complicit with uh, the lynchings and the killings uh, that are going on and the violence in the, in the modern civil rights movement. So what we have here is uh, the body of Christ divided by race and that division just didn't happen overnight as you've seen it it's really started almost as soon as uh, jamestown was founded jamestown is found jamestown is founded in 1607 the first slave hits the shores of virginia in 1619 Presbyterians are, are very much a part of this process in terms of the ways in which they were positioned as leaders in the community, uh, owners of large plantations, and even uh, setting up the tone with their other uh, de denominational brothers in Christ to make sure that African Americans were let uh, out of the family of God in very harsh ways. <clears throat> 
or pushed out. So what does this say? Um, the modern civil rights movement enforced desegregation in public facilities and education, but it could not enforce these measures in the church, nor in the hearts and minds of most white evangelical believers. If you look at your church today, many people can say, well, our church may have, especially if I speak to Presbyterians, uh, predominantly white Presbyterian churches who have remained that way since almost their founding, you could look at your church makeup and ask the question, um, what are you doing to bridge the gap? What are you doing to heal the divide? How are we going to deal with the unspoken and undiscussed, unaddressed issue of racism today in the body of Christ and in the American church? One of the first steps is to have more conversations and workshops like these where you tell the truth about the history and you confront it. And you don't confront it outside of Christ. You confront it from your identity in Christ, your call to create a diverse body of believers in unity that transcends your racial and ethnic background. And you're called to work for the kingdom of God here on earth. Dr. William Yo of Columbia Seminary, uh, he's written a wonderful article, um, which I will uh, send everyone. I forgot to put that up here. But it says, he, he has some wonderful quotes. This is, in, this is actually, I think, in Presbyterian Outlook, so you can Google that as well. But he says, how important is it to differentiate between Christ's teaching and what's been perpetuated by people called Christians? I'll say that. That's such a good quote from him. How important is it to differentiate between Christ's teaching and what's been perpetuated by people called Christians? I would submit to you that there have been people throughout the American church that call themselves Christians, but did not fully live up to the truths of the teachings of Christ. It is high time that the church begin to do so. His second quote, let's be honest about the rape. Let's be honest about the violence. Let's be honest about the dehumanization. Let's be honest about the policing and the slave patrols. This is where the church has to be honest about its own complicity, connection to these things. And some of you might be saying, well, you know, that was 150 years ago, right? It was 300 years ago. What does that have to do with me? Just because you're, you're not there, you weren't there 300 years ago, uh, you're still reaping, whether you're black or white, you're still reaping the legacies of this history. The reason why we see a Breonna Taylor and a George Floyd, a Philando Castile and so many others is because this history has never been addressed. And the church is, so, is supposed to have the solution. The church has the power of Jesus Christ, the creator of the entire universe, and we have the solution. We have the power to change. We have the power to confront. But it's all in Jesus. It's all in our position in Jesus. And only the Lord Jesus can bridge the gap. But we have to partner with him to do so. If we don't, we will continue to see the racial unrest and all the inequities in terms of redlining, redlining mass incarceration, redistricting, systemic racism and injustice and institutional policies against uh, non-white people. It's, it's so overwhelming, but the church has the answer and that answer is partnering and processing in truth telling about its own history and moving in processes of forgiveness of itself, of its past, and then trying to figure out how to make amends to those groups of people who have suffered from that legacy. And I would submit that both white people and black people have suffered in various ways. Certainly African-Americans have suffered way more than their white uh, counterparts in the faith, but racism affects both blacks and whites in various ways. 
Dr. Martin Luther King, as I moved to a close, struggled to get the church to really move forward and address this back in the 1960s. He said, he, I've heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I've watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. We remember the words of Christ. This is if you offer a cup of cold water in my name, you've done it unto me. The church is called to heal the racial wounds in other parts of his body. The church is called to begin to address social issues from its position in Christ. It can no longer afford to push this off the table or to push it on government or to push it on other policies. If the church is to be a viable living representative of the presence of God, it must deal with the untold stories of race and racism in its own community. Martin Luther King was disappointed and even wept over the laxity of the church. And this is in 1963, and here we are today. He says, yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect, through fear of being nonconformist. What are we to do if we are to move forward? Number one, we've got to begin to let go our fear. Number two, we've got to engage in the power of Jesus Christ through our identity in him to fearlessly step into conversations about the racial past. And for churches that are listening to me, the first thing you can do is talk about your own church's racial history. Talk about the slave owning families and don't just put them down, acknowledge that they missed the mark, acknowledge that they've done wrong, but begin to look at it and don't just push it to the past or don't just stuff it down, but begin to process it. And then go to those congregations that you know have descended from those slave owning families and begin to create conversations for healing and even unity. Through the power of God's grace in Jesus Christ and overcoming racism, we are able to confront implicit bias and racism in the body of Christ. We are able to become more conscious of his power through hearing truths about our racial past. And we are able to deal with complicity on various levels, wherever it confronts itself. We're also able to deal with longstanding legacies of white privilege and operation within our own communities. And we're able to even engage in creating relationships across both black and white and even Asian and Latina, Latino churches. This is what we can do. So how do we do it? This is wonderful, right, for me to put this up on a PowerPoint and say, this is what you can do. You can do this in Jesus. Again, I point us to the Emmanuel journaling approach. That every time a church decides we want to have a conversation, those conversations have to start with prayer. And they have to start with interactive prayer. They have to start with inviting the presence of Christ into these stories, into these communities, into the telling of the stories into the processing of these stories. It has to start with, after you have engaged Jesus, to ask him the hard questions that many of your members might have on both sides of the color line, such as, why did slavery happen? Where were you, God, when this happened? Why have non-white people suffered so much in America? Those questions are hard questions that nobody fully has the answer to except for Jesus and his healing power to help you engage and process through that. So 
I'm at the end of my presentation and I know I've said some challenging things. I know I said some hard things. I know some of the information I've given was very hard and I just touched the tip of the iceberg with all of the information that I could have given you. But I invite you before you turn this video off to stop again and engage in the Emmanuel practice. Return back to the positive memory that you've had. Invite Jesus into that space. Ask for his presence. Ask him again what you're feeling emotionally. Help him process even your feelings at this moment and write those down. And then by faith, ask him to assist you in releasing those feelings. You might be very angry right now. You might even be offended. Or you might be incredibly sad and feel a sense of great hopelessness. By faith, work through the Emmanuel journaling and ask him to assist you in releasing those feelings to him. And then ask him again what or who you need to forgive. As you do so, knowing that you're asking for his capacity in you to forgive. It could be to forgive the whole institution of the church. It could be to forgive your ancestors. It could be to forgive uh, white people. It could be to forgive black people. Wherever you're at, this is not a place for a shame that debilitates you and wants you to turn things off. There's such a thing called healthy shame. A shame that says, I don't, that's not who I am as a Christian. That's not who I am as a believer and a lover of God. That's not who I am. And that shame leads you to change and it leads your community to change. So point number six in this Emmanuel journaling process. I, I actually have for you to say out loud, by faith, I forgive and name those who you or those things or institutions or people that you need to forgive and release them to Jesus. Knowing that the Lord will restore, heal, and bring justice to yourself, your family, and your community. And then ask him to give you his capacity for new strategies that contribute to the healing, the wounds of racism and silence. The body of Christ has been silent for so long on this issue. There have been pocket moments when they've spoken up, but there's never been a massive united outcry against the injustices and legacies that are still happening from slavery. And then finally return back to that positive memory. So I invite you to pause the video at this moment and work through these eight steps and don't rush through them and be very intentional about hearing the Lord's voice inside of you. If you do, don't, don't do these steps. It'll be very hard for you to have capacity to move forward. Finally, here are other practical things that you can do. You can pray for racism to be annihilate, annihilated in the body of Christ. You can create other truth-telling workshops for your church's racial past. I certainly ask you to consider my husband and I and more Grace Ministries for that. You can create spaces of forgiveness and storytelling. You can create dialogue between uh, churches of different ethnicities, especially those that are in your specific church's racial past. Become conscious of your own biases. Open dialogue on issues of racism and white privilege. You might hear and might have heard racist ideas are ideas and stereotypes of non-white people or even white people for that matter. Counter and challenge those especially if they are about women or men, 
And then other things that you can do, you can unite with social justice groups. And so these are just a couple of things that, that you can do. I put prayer as the main one because the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. Even though we might not have been participants in the, the wrongs that our ancestors have done, you're still impacted by their legacies. And so we may have to join and unify ourselves as body of believers across racial lines to come together in prayer and ask the Lord forgiveness on behalf of our ancestors who compromise the truths of Christianity, who ignore the human experience of suffering of non-white people, who were duplicitous in their worship to God and in the way they treated their neighbor. Prayer is so important. Second Chronicles 7.14 is where each and every believer and church should begin. And the Emmanuel journaling process is a tool by which you can build capacity to do this type of racial healing in the body of Christ. Thank you. I hope this has blessed.